We lost him just over three years ago, and uh, uh, we miss him very much. But one of the things he used to say is, any tin, tin horn dictator around the world can have a Bill of Rights. But whether or not it's able to protect you, to protect any individual, depends on the extent to which that system of government constrains those in power and prevents them from accumulating excessive power. Now, you've heard a lot about this accumulation of power in recent days. And all of a sudden, on the left, we see a magical resurgence, a magical reawakening of this idea that there ought to be separation of powers within our system of government. I almost went into anaphylactic shock when I saw Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi talking about separation of powers on national television. That's great, but I wish they would have talked about it sooner. Where, where was their outrage over the violation of the Constitution and the separation of powers in the last decade? Where was the concern about Congress's Article I power to declare war when President Obama declared a national emergency in 2011 as part of his undeclared war in Libya? Where was the concern about Congress's Article I power over immigration and naturalization when, in 2012, President Obama, having failed to get legislation passed through Congress that he wanted, created a brand new immigration amnesty program out of thin air? Or when he, again, unilaterally expanded his unconstitutional, illegal program in 2014, just days after his party had suffered massive losses at the polls? The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, our deviation from federalism and from separation of powers, the vertical protection of federalism that keeps most of the power close to the people at the state and local level, and the horizontal protection of separation of powers that says we're going to have one branch that makes the laws, another branch that enforces them, and yet another branch that interprets them where people come into conflict as to their meaning. We've deviated from both of those principles under the leadership of houses of representatives, of senates, and white houses of every conceivable partisan combination. What is making America great again, and what I believe will continue to make America great again, is our continued move in that direction toward rebalancing power, toward sending power back to where it belongs, which is with the people. In order to reignite this national conversation that I need, think we need to have, uh, I've, I've written a book, uh, a, new, a new book that comes out on April 23rd. It's called Our Lost Declaration. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon today, by the way, pre-order. Uh, but it delves into some of these topics. It delves into why it is that we became a country in the first place. Why it is that two and a half centuries ago, under the administration of King George III, we decided that we as a people had been taxed too much. We had been regulated too oppressively. We had been represented by a government that was far from us and slow to respond to the needs of the people. We, as Americans, can learn much from our founding generation, from remembering why it is that we fly the stars and stripes and no longer the Union Jack. It wasn't just about getting rid of a monarchy. It was about our freedom. This isn't a partisan issue. This is a constitutional issue, and it is an absolute imperative for our freedom. Just as we have been since 1776, we, as Americans, are ready for this fight. Are you ready to join me and your fellow Americans in restoring freedom? I thank each of you for the work that you do. You're the activists. You're the people who move the movement. I say, bring it on. Let's roll. Let's keep making America great again. Thank you very much.